We're going to turn the microphones on in just a moment. Uh, David, do you want to turn on the microphones? They're on. They're on? Okay, very good. Okay. Mr. Chairman, the uh, meeting is now live and recording, and you do have a quorum. The meeting oh, is yours. Let's uh, call the February 20th, 2020 PRAB meeting. Um, let's do a call to order and roll call. So, Sean Michael. Present. Jason. Present. Phil. Present. Joey. Here. Scott is not here. I'm here. And we have a new person. Esteban. Esteban. Welcome, Esteban. Thank you. All right, we have a quorum. Now let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty Take a minute and look at the uh, meeting agenda for this, this evening. Jim, any changes or anything? Any? Uh, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, there is no changes at this time. Okay. Do you need a motion? Mr. Yeah, I need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve tonight's meeting agenda. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Agenda approved. The approval for the minutes of the December 19th, 2019 meeting. I'm going to take a moment and look at those. Thank you. And Mr. Vice Chair, just for the record, there are no minutes from the January meeting as we did not have issues to discuss, so we put, canceled the meeting. Excellent. I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from December 19th, 2019. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Minutes approved. Do we have any public comment this evening? Chair? Mr. Chair, I have not received any public comment. Okay. All right. We're all ready to uh, do the election of the officers? Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, the process would be to first have a call for uh, an election nominations and then election for a chairman. Uh, and then for the vice chair, and then for the secretary. Okay. Do I mean, you have any discussion with this? No, but I'll make a nomination to uh, vote for Scott for chairman. Is that because he's not here? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'll third that too. That's what happens when you don't show That's up. What happens. But he also volunteered. He's, he's, a, good he's a good guy. <laughs> All right, so... Are there any other nominations? Anyone? All righty. I have a motion for Mr. Stokowski as chairman. Now we have a vote. Or a vote. We have, we have a motion, right? Yeah. 
that that make a motion? Make a motion to vote on the chairman. I'll make a motion to approve Scott or vote for Scott for chairman. I'll second. Okay, all in favor of Scott Stokowski as the chairman. Aye. For Aye. Any opposed? Yeah. Okay. It looks like Scott has it. No opposed. We'll move on to the vice chairman. Uh, open um, the floor to nominations. Yeah, open the floor to nominations. I'm going to nominate Dave again. So I'll make a motion to nominate Dave <clears throat> as vice chair. I'll second that. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. No. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Now to secretary. Joey, do you I'm enjoy willing secretary? to let anyone else do it if, they're will, if they want to. But, so but I will also continue doing it. You do a great job. Nice. Okay. You really do. <laughs> Does anybody care to have it? <laughs> then in that case, I will nominate Joey as secretary. I'll second that. Any opposed? Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, there you go, Joey. Congratulations. <clears throat> Committee appointments. How about that, Jim? This is where we, uh, we had talked during the fall that we wanted, now that we have uh, a full board of seven people, we wanted to start getting more people engaged in our program partners to become liaisons. So uh, I, I put down committee appointment. I, I, I made a mistake. I realized I should have said liaison mm -hmm. uh, appointment. So for that, I apologize. But it's uh, <clears throat> the purpose of a liaison is to give each individual program partner one additional direct voice uh, to get back to uh, the, the PRAP as well as to the city on issues that are sp specific to your individual program. And uh, <clears throat> it's... Uh, Ideally, we're looking for people who are engaged in the program or are willing to at least get engaged in the program. So from there, perhaps uh, if there's any individuals who have any particular preferences, you might want to start there as a starting, use that as the starting point. Like for football, baseball, Eagle Sticks, and NFL. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have Woody basketball. Allen. Basketball. And, you know, we have uh, uh, lac you know, lacrosse and swimming and, uh, you know, Tennis and lots of other programs here. So we're growing. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> what were the lists that we're doing committees for? Okay. You, you did say swimming? Yeah. Okay, okay so right now, we, uh, in, in past years, we had Hopewell baseball, Eagle Sticks, and NFL football. But, you know, the basketball program has ballooned on us. Uh, as you will hear tonight, swimming. Uh, Tom, help me out. What are the other programs? Uh, we got Milton Tennis Center. Tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Bakhtar Rock here. Perhaps we put that in arts programming. We could. Yeah. Lump them. The, yeah, and so that would yep. be. Uh, and then Star. Bakhtar Rock. Dance, <clears throat> yeah, rhythm and shoes, and our photography program. Yes. Photography. Okay. What else? Who else are we missing? Maybe they do I count? Yeah, Challenge Island. Uh, summer camps. So that could probably lump into the arts too. Yes, summer camp. Okay. All right. So we've got. Seven different things to cover. We've got arts, basketball, swimming, tennis, football, lacrosse, which we probably should just say lacrosse, Eagle Sticks, and uh, boys and girls, so lacrosse and baseball. <clears throat> Who's been doing the baseball? 
that I've been doing in the past, but um, I was probably going <coughs> to request to do football this year. Okay. So, Chairman, I'm happy to volunteer to continue working with uh, Kim and the basketball organization. I second that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> You were coaching baseball. It will have me. Yeah, I know you Absolutely. knew. It was first game. Yeah. Tell the truth. Not really familiar with this. Baseball. 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 Mm -hmm. baseball. I'm happy to continue with the lacrosse, both the Eagle Sticks and the uh, Boys Lacrosse. Okay. Thank boys you, Jason. Lacrosse. All right. So we're going to have boys across and girls across. Is that what we're doing? I'll do the same thing. Yeah. All right. So the two of you sharing the both the boys and the girls across. Yeah. That that's works we, very well. That's what we shared the last yeah. time. Too. Yes, yeah. and that worked very very well. Okay. So. So Sean, you want to go over to football? I'll do football. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Basketball. And swimming, tennis. Art. Swimming, tennis. This year. Well, I'll volunteer for swimming. There you go. Okay. So that leaves tennis and arts and Bach to rock. Um, Dave, being that uh, tennis and swimming are at the same facility. Well, let's do that then. That's fine. You would take I swimming like and tennis? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, no problem. And then uh, perhaps we nominate Scott for the arts program. Yes. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> okay. Scott for arts. All right. So you, now what you have to do is create a summary motion indicating the uh, sport and the nominated person, and then you, uh, you vote as a group, you know, okay. on all of them. So I make a motion that for Hopewell Baseball, Esteban's going to take over that. Eagle Sticks, uh, or lacrosse, is going to be Jason and Joey. Um, NFL football, NFL football is going to be Sean Michael. Phil for basketball, Dave for swimming and tennis, and Scott for the arts. Do I have a motion for okay. an approval on that? I'll second the motion. Good. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That's finished. Any unfinished business? Mr. Chairman, we do not. Okay. New business. Mr. Chairman, uh, as you can see tonight, we have a brand new member of the board, uh, Mr. Esteban Kalina. Uh, Mr. Kalina is a uh, uh, very, uh, <laughs> very busy gentleman, uh, comes to us. So uh, I met him through uh, coaching his daughter at uh, AYSA softball this past fall. But Esteban's also been very involved at Hope Baseball coaching his son and a number of teams. So uh, perhaps, Mr. Uh, Kalina, if you could take... take uh, Two or three minutes and just introduce yourself. Tell us a little about yourself and your family, what you do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, Esteban, thank you, Jim, for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I'm a lawyer by profession, but I don't know. I don't know we're like a lawyer. I have a software company, but I've been involved with the baseball since I have five years. So I play baseball for 13 years. I'm from Venezuela. In Venezuela, everybody play baseball. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so that's the reason that for by here, here to help Milton to be better in the park for Hopewell. It's a great park. So that's the reason I, I hope to, to do my best. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Before uh, the next time, I'll make sure we get everyone else's phone number so you can stay in touch. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Then um, next is the discussion on the proposal, proposed adult soccer program. Uh, I'd like to defer to you, Todd McElveen, on this. At the, uh, at the Cox Road facility, um, UFA, the previous owners, had run a adult soccer program out of that facility. Uh, the, I guess you could say some of the leadership of that group um, that was outside of UFA uh, that basically participated in the program um, want to keep it there and kind of start their own little thing. Um, we've had a couple meetings with them and 
we have to have some discussion with the board about you know how we want to approach it um, as a maybe a program provider or as a rental opportunity. Um, We've made it very, very clear that you know our youth programming comes first, so they're not going to get uh, you know priority per se access. Um, they would they would basically get the overflow um, as what we don't get. Um, currently, the way that their last season went, their Milton resident participation was rather low. Um, maybe something to keep in mind. I think he said it was like five percent. Um, so that's where we are now. We're still in discussions back and forth. We're not going to be doing a spring season with them. Uh, we're trying to pump the brakes and make sure we get our, you know, get everything set and learn Cox Road a little bit before we, you know, throw a new program out there. Um, but that's where we are right there with the, uh, the new soccer program for adults. Did they give any indication of when they would want to play? Evenings. Uh, the way they made it sound, anything we could give them. Uh, the way it was arranged before is they had, I think it was two nights a week, starting at 7, 7.30, going until 10.30 at night, uh, as many fields as they could get. They had a couple hundred participants, I believe it was. Is that right, Jim? Do you remember that? Yeah, um, I think it was between two and three hundred. <laughs> two or three hundred. I'm going to repeat that to Jim. Uh, <laughs> do we know what season? Any they, season? they would do four seasons if they could. Got it. Yeah. Would that conflict with any other program partners based on those times and the days? Yeah. 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 They 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 would get uh, whatever's left. Uh, Tom, I believe they said it was about two hundred and fifty. Two fifty. Okay. Okay. But only 10 or 12 of those people were Milton folks. Okay, kind of, sort of. That sounds the, right. <laughs> uh, when we, we flat told them, said, that's a concern, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, <clears throat> they certainly committed to try and, and grow, uh, you know, within Milton. If they know they have an established home, try and recruit more within Milton. The uh, program itself is actually got a sponsor. The teams have a sponsor uh, in the old blind dog. And uh, apparently there's quite the connection between playing soccer and then going to the old blind dog. Uh, so that's where this connection was made and they asked, could they continue this? Um, I, I brought them in twice and explained to them. I said, Our, we bought that, that field for lacrosse. You know, expand our lacrosse offerings. You know, you would be getting whatever. You would always be second fiddle to the lacrosse programming. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were fine with it. And certainly as adults, they can go later into the evening than our kids can. So we think we could work it out that it, uh, uh, it doesn't have uh, an impact on the recreation programming. And where it does, they understand that they would not be the benefactor. So my um, other concern would be around just over usage of the field. Yes. Right? And yes. So it's just more people running on the field. <coughs> that is correct. For an extra couple hours mm -hmm. as opposed to probably that more of a concern than the actual finding time for them, right? I'm sure we could find time for them. But that is indeed correct. Um, so that would be my bigger concern. <coughs> so no rest for the fields. Well, again, we can dictate when they can use it when they can't to make sure that there's rest time for the grass. You know, the, rest, the season, all grass needs a rest break. We do that at yeah. Bell Park right now. We schedule six weeks of rest for the fields. So we could certainly do the same thing over Cox Road. Yeah. And probably would be the prudent thing to do as well. So it's possible. It'd just be very limited. Yes. Okay. But a rectangle field does get a lot more beating than a baseball field, the outfields. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. No question about that. I don't know if those eight-year-olds really can dig up an outfield. Well, that's because they're digging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally, they're digging. Yeah, they're digging <clears throat> a hole in there. <laughs> so the question here is um, we would like a recommendation from you guys. Should we 
uh, move forward? Should we do it as an experiment? Should we hold off? You know, um, you know, this is new program. It's an opportunity to uh, expand the programming. It starts at a very low number of Milton residents. Um, we might be able to work something with Rush Soccer. We understand that their adult programming is quite low. Perhaps we could do something to, because they would like to find ways to work with the city. Maybe they could move their, uh, some of their adult programming, uh, some of those, those participants over to our programming. You know, it's, it, there's a world of possibilities out there. Mm -hmm. So I'll just, just give my two cents. I think any time we have an opportunity to add additional programming, albeit not youth, um, we should all absolutely consider it, particularly if we've got the room and the space to, to do so. As far as the residency, I don't think that's uncommon for most adult soccer leagues. I think I'd look back at when I played in Roswell, very few of the participants were actually from the town of Roswell. So I'm not sure that's so uncommon for uh, adult soccer. So I'm not too alarmed by that. Um, but I think, again, if we've got the space... Uh, to do so, we should at least figure out how to make it work um, so long as its field does not get overused uh, at the detriment of the, the lacrosse team. Yeah, I mean, I think, Tom, how many how many participants did you say they had? I think it was between two and 300. Two and 300. 300. I, mean, I, thought, so. that's, I was trying to go through my notes. I think it's... I was going to say that's a good... I would assume, I mean, I'm, I haven't played adult soccer, um, but youth soccer was maybe 10 kids on a team, so that's that's a fair number of teams. It's, uh, they play 11 v 11, so it'll probably be 16 to 18 players on a team, maybe more rostered because okay. of the Yeah, it's usually up. about 20 to 25 rostered because yeah. usually half the people only show up. <laughs> right, okay. So, I mean, I guess the question is, do we have, um, for Coxfield, I know when you guys did the... Uh, uh, the planning session for practice and stuff. Do we know how much roughly available or how much time that lacrosse is planning to take up in, well, we're not doing the spring, you said, for soccer, but what it would look like in the fall for next year? Um, I mean, I feel like Sunday would, would be a day. Where it would be very hard. To, it'd be hard to predict in the fall because yeah. we don't know what the football numbers are going to be next year. Okay. And how much overflow is going to go over there. Go over there. I think it would be interesting to explore at least through the summer, right? when the fields are less used, probably, give us an opportunity to see if there's something with Rush and kind of on a trial basis to see if something that might work. And as a one season, again, the summer, we typically don't have lots and lots of those evening hours, those late evening hours that they would want would be open. I think it's worth giving it a try. You know, see what's um, there to... I don't point. like the numbers being 5% Milton. Um, I'd like to see them work something out with Rush, meaning why can they not go to Rush if they've got low numbers and work out field space with Rush before we start tackling Milton's space. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see them present something here. Instead of us discussing something, what they're going to do, where's their representative to give us a proposal of what they're trying to do? Okay. And that's my opinion. I'd like to know more about our scheduling issue for what's coming up before I say, hey, let's give the space to some adults. Now, they say they can use late night. I mean, that sounds good, but let's make sure the field's available for the boys that are over there right now. I know the boys the lacrosse team is over there. I'd like to hear from the other programs that are currently servicing Milton residents before I give it to non-Milton residents. Certainly, if that's the will of the uh, board, I can uh, request uh, mm -hmm. the organization to come to next month's meeting and uh, make a formal presentation. <coughs> Gentlemen, you're fine with that? I think that's yeah, good. That's good. good. Yep. Get a handle of what they want to do. Yeah. All All right. Let's see if you can just bring them in, Jim. And... Okay. I'm comfortable with that. Thank yeah, you very much. That's... Appreciate that. Okay. Off to discussion of city email policy once again. How's that going, Jim? Uh, okay. <clears throat> the uh, I, quick show of hands, if I may. How many of you have successfully gotten onto the city emails? Okay. Um, the uh, uh, I know a number of you had some difficulties. I did work with IT, and you know they were able to get things resolved. The reason that we're trying to go to city emails is because your work on this board 
is subject to open records. And therefore, uh, you want to have, uh, we want those emails going through uh, a server that the city's backed up. So if we have a situation where we are asked for uh, open records request, we can readily produce them. Uh, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's of great importance that all of this board get their city emails up and running because I will quickly reach a point where I will be specifically instructed to stop using your private emails. All right. There is also a city email policy form I sent to all of you. I know some of you have gotten them back. We haven't consolidated, so I don't know off the top of my head who has or has not uh, sent in those policies. But if you haven't, uh, that's important because you have to put in writing that you understand why this email policy is in effect, why we're doing this with the emails. Um, and I'd like to point out for the record uh, that in uh, December, I uh, became a member of the Cambridge High School uh, School Governance Council. And just this week, I had to start up my Fulton County email because, again, it's a government, there's transparency requirements, and so now I have a third email account I have to track. Uh, but it's just part of the gig, and this way my records. So I'm doing the same thing you guys are doing, just in a different volunteer capacity. So um, I saw two of you did not uh, indicate. Um, Joey, have you gotten yours? I've gotten it. I haven't even looked at it, so it's my fault. I will do that. I just te texted myself to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get it again. I'll get it again. Dave, I appreciate yeah. that. And I was on the governance council once before, too, and I know they make you do the... Mm -hmm. the yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. For, uh, discussion of the PRAB stipend. Okay. Uh, once you're supposed to have this discussion with you, as you know, the city, uh, or maybe you don't know, the city budgets... Uh, a stipend, as a stipend budget for all of the boards that work as volunteers. Uh, it's not meant as pay. It's just meant as a, as a thank you for the time you put in. If you actually compare the amount of money, which is $50 for every meeting you attend, if you compare that to the amount of time you guys actually wind up putting in, it's probably something like about 12 cents an hour. Uh, but... Uh, you know, uh, when I was at Alpharetta and we had the same thing, we we spoke, we spoke of beer and peanut money. It was uh, it was just a thank you for uh, you know volunteering, and uh, you know you have the right to waive it. You have the right, the right to receive it. Uh, so I do need to get from each of you an email on your city of Milton email account. Uh, indicating if you wish to waive or receive. If you wish to receive, there's a small book of paperwork you have to fill out. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it is something that you're entitled to. Uh, the elected officials fully support it, and uh, you know, you're encouraged to, to accept it if you wish. Okay? So uh, please let me know, hopefully within the next week, if your, what your position is with regard to the calendar year of 2020, regard receiving the PRAB stipend. Okay? Great. Moving on to city and staff reports and communications. All right. The program partner review time. Uh, folks, we try to do this once a year, uh, and it's amazing how this grows. I remember when the program partner review was three people, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's important that you guys know that this group exists. It's important that all these guys know that you exist and that each of you know who exists because one of your best sources for getting new participants in your program is the other programs because they've already got people who are active and engaged. So the more you guys can network and work together, the more you have the potential of growing your own programs. So... Uh, Tom, did we have a specific format, or we just want to, you know, draw numbers from a hat, or do we want to you know, start with the biggest guy first and let him go? <laughs> um, I know we had a couple of folks that had some time restraints tonight that I'd like to respect, um, but other than that, no, I'd, I'd like for everyone to talk for just a couple minutes, two, three minutes about your program. 
um, what you offer, who it's for, um, maybe some some challenges you're dealing with. Um, we've got a lot of folks here running programming, so they might be able to either a help you with it or b have the same problem as you. And you know, you know our parks and board will realize that it's an issue um, and things maybe that are working good and maybe highlights. Uh, that's up to you, but um, you know, let's not go too long and put everyone to sleep. Uh, but if, if we could start with, uh, you know, Terry, um, I know he's got, you know, things going on this evening. And, uh, you know, from there, we'll just go around. I'm Terry O'Brien. I'm the tennis director at Milton Tennis Center. Been there 25 years. That's a long time. But, um, survived five ownerships, and including the city taking over two and a half years ago. Jim, is that right? Yeah. And uh, the program, as most of you know about tennis in Milton, is very popular. Uh, the North Fulton area has more tennis players in that area than the whole state of Georgia. So it's like a mecca because of the country clubs and also the parks um, involved in ELTA and USDA leagues. Uh, we currently... To, um, run both out of the club. I have mostly like adults. I have 90% and above uh, Milton residents and with the juniors, 95% uh, um, Milton residents. So um, very popular and the lessons we offer, you know, anywhere from six year old to uh, 75. <laughs> So no one's excluded on level either. We have all levels. We have competitive teams. We have beginners, intermediate, and same with uh, adults too. Um, currently, we um, are at capacity with only four courts. We have the most amount of teams for ELTA and USTA in the state of Georgia at our, at our club for that size facility. And um, obviously, we're... In the future, looking to expand, to move to two more courts, that would help tremendously, uh, especially with, uh, it would open up for team events, as in like tournaments, and uh, I've been having the high school come practice at, at the courts, and that's challenging too, um, with only four courts available with the regular people playing, so that would open up another, um, just a whole, whole different ball game for me. Um, as of now, for the spring 2020, I'm at capacity for lessons, uh, for group lessons, for beginners, intermediate, juniors. So I'm booked through May with all my um, programming. That's um, to sign up for. It's all already booked for, for spring. So that's good and bad because I can't really. I have to start turning people down, which I try and never do. So... Um, we, we are in a process right now um, over the course of this year trying to work out fixing the clubhouse up. I'm sure you guys are aware of um, the bathroom situation. We, we don't really have bathrooms because of the we had a mold problem in the old clubhouse. We had to shut that down and get porta potties out there. So we're working on a resolution, in fact, soon to get the trailers back out there. So it, it's... Um, accessible for the leagues to, to use because we can't use the small part of potties for our leagues. Um, the tennis courts, uh, the city of Milton and um, USDA helped resurface the courts. Um, they were severely cracked and now they're perfect condition. They did uh, a great job putting a, a layer of padding and mesh over the cracks, and they're like high-grade U.S. Open quality courts now, so it's perfect. The lights are perfect. Um, we have um, new benches we got. <laughs> Thank you very much for my new benches that were falling apart, my old ones. But um, And I just really enjoy that the, the community of Milton has been around for so long. and I've seen, obviously, I've been there so long. I'm getting old, but I, I teach kids, uh, parents, grandkids. Um, and so it's kind of a nice little community. It'll be great when we do get the clubhouse going because after they play, they can kind of stick around and hang out. Like, as of now, there's really not 
nothing, there was no gazebo, there's no, nothing, there's chairs, but it, it kind of lost its feel where you can kind of hang out and watch your kids play and, and just kind of spend, you know, the day there. Um, Saturdays, our courts are booked um, basically from 9, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and it's a solid, you know, maybe 120 people come come through the club on a, every Saturday. And Sunday, uh, they're booked from 12 to 4 o'clock with leagues. So the weekends are usually, you know, my, my big time for matches and, and, and foot traffic going through the club. Um, I, I appreciate working with the city. It's been nothing but great um, supporting, um, you know, with all the challenges with, with, you know, keeping the clubhouse and trying to make that work and working with the swim as well over the summer. Uh, it's been great. So thank you and sorry to be so long. No, no problem. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Terry, if I can just add uh, two things. One, I want to assure you I confirmed this week that the improved portable toilets on trailers uh, will be delivered next week, as promised. I, I didn't even think about it because I trust you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. And I also want to let you know that in this at the November meeting, um, this board went through a number of recommendations of needs for the uh, facility and one of the recommendations they made which will be presented next month at a workshop to council is to move forward with the plan to expand two more parks so the board has been in support of you and what you're doing thank you so much okay. <laughs> by the way uh, i know terry you're stuck time if you have to leave at once you're done that's thank perfectly you, thank fine you. All right, thank, thank you. you all thank you thank you hey terry is there one thing outside of capacity and I think we all recognize the constraint that we have for most of our programs. Uh, there's a capacity constraint. But outside of that, is there one thing that the city could be doing to make your program better or more successful? Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty much I've kind of run separate even when it was a country club. You know, I kind of ran my, my deal. And as uh, long as I have support, like, you know, if I have bathrooms, I don't really ask for too much. But the lights working, the cords, uh, and I, I pretty much make the rest happen. And, and the, the, it's, it's pretty easy with all the, the people but, um, that want to play. That's a good problem. But uh, I feel like anything I need, I can call, you know, Jim or Tom, you know, but I try not to call them too often. Great. Thank you, Terry. Jim, are we addressing bathrooms? Pardon? Are we addressing the bathroom situation? Uh, the, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, right now, uh, we have an individual uh, bathroom for men, individual bathroom for women uh, up on a trailer. We have a standard plastic porta potty for uh, ADA, um, but that's really not going to meet the standard that's required for when we have the USTA and ALTA programming there. Uh, Terry was kind enough to explain this to us, um, and so uh, Steve Krokoff has authorized me to go out and get larger, better uh, trailers, uh, bathrooms, which will still be on a trailer. They're still portable. Uh, and he also simultaneously has expedited uh, the renovation of the Milton Country Club building itself. That's good news. And uh, so we are now going with some state-approved uh, contractors, so we don't have to go out to do the whole formal bid process. These are contractors who are on state contracts that we can tap into. So, uh, yes, we're still moving at the speed of government, but it's fast track at government speed. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Jim. Anybody else? Gentlemen? Thank you, Terry. Sure. Anybody else have time issues you'd like to go to? Okay, um, I'm Scott Minot, um, standing in for Stephanie Minot and um, Beth Wilson, who lead the, the swimming program. Um, a little background, my wife and I moved here back in 2012, and we're part of Milton Country Club, and 
And, you know, basically the swim team taught my triplet 11 year olds how to swim. So it's been great for us. And we were super excited when Jim and the city, you know, allowed us to continue, you know, the program um, once the city bought the club. Um, <clears throat> the first year, sorry, I got a couple minutes. Uh, we had 78 swimmers the first year. Um, last year we had 144, and we expect, you know, additional growth. Um, we opened registration on the 15th, and our registration is $125 a swimmer. Um, we're starting a new program this year. Uh, it's mini Mustangs. So these are kids four to five years old that they're not afraid of the water. They, they may not um, feel real confident swimming um, to swim in meets, but they want to work towards that. So that's going to be a, you know, a valuable new you know, program for us. Um, the city's done a great job, you know, working uh, on the facilities. I mean, obviously that that clubhouse and pool needed needed some work. We're excited about the clubhouse because when we do um, meets, we need somewhere to stage for for results and the people that are working on all the timing that the people are, that run the times from the the pool deck back for for entry into the system for results and ribbons and and all that and um, we just you know it's been a great it's been a great program we go to tech every year for the the big meet um, I don't know exactly how many kids you know we had go to tech but we're looking to grow that as well there were more people last year than than the first year. Um, so it's just, it's been a great program. So we're just appreciative and, and looking forward to this season and seasons to come. Right. Scott, I'd uh, like to just add a couple components to let you folks be aware. Uh, first and foremost, would you please express the thanks of me personally and the city overall to your wife and to Beth for the help that they have given us not only in starting the program, but in the renovations and projects we're working on right now. Uh, your, your wife and Beth uh, picked out all new furniture. That order has been placed, and uh, we have it scheduled for delivery at the end of April. I think they even told you they didn't need as much as you wanted to give them in the first place. So yeah. That was great. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, no, they were very uh, budget conscious. Yeah. And... Uh, Right now, Thomas is working on uh, a government uh, bid type process to sell the old stuff. Uh, so we want to have that out. We have the uh, bid nearly complete for the deck resurfacing. The pump house renovations have been completed. Um, and uh, the awning, we're going to get cleaned. We're not going to replace the awning this year. Uh, I'd like to talk with my peers about the idea of perhaps removing the outdoor bar area. Leave the awning, but remove the outdoor bar. I think that's just a waste of space right now. I'd love to get the thoughts of you and your wives. Uh, so if you could get back to me on that. Yeah, the, the only benefit to that is when we, you know, serve food um, at the meets. But during the, during the week... I mean, when people are up there mm -hmm. during the summer at the pool, yeah, it's there's really no use for it. So we, we could probably figure out a temporary solution for that if that wasn't there. Um, and, you know, I'm also just even besides the swim team component of it, just excited about the pool when we get all this done, what an asset it's going to be mm -hmm. for Milton. Because, you know, last year, uh, I mean, we were there when when it was going down the drain before Milton um, bought it. And, you know, when there's, you know, 10, 10 people there, 15 people there. And then the first year we, you know, that Milton took it over, um, even with some challenges that people started to come. And last year, I mean, there were days where, you know, 70, 80 people would come through there in an afternoon. And I think once all this work's done, it's going to be a really nice place for people, you know, to take their families and, 
and spend, you know, afternoon. I mean, I would, I'd leave work and go up there and meet, meet the kids and they could swim and I'd meet Steph and the kids and there'd be a community there. So I think it's a real opportunity to build, you know, community in Milton. Um, and then with the swim team on top of that, I mean, it's just, it's growing leaps and bounds. So thanks for all the support. For the few times that food is getting served there these days, uh, the, uh, I think portable tables could be set up. I think we could use more deck space. And if we're going to resurface the deck, now is the time to remove that outdoor bar. Absolutely. Okay. I, I don't think they'll have any problem with that. Okay. So they'll be right. back uh, Tuesday. Right. Okay. Gentlemen? All right. Questions? Gentlemen? All right. Thank you. Thank you I, I do have one idea that attracted me. You talked about the mini Mustangs. Juan Salas runs uh, Hopewell Baseball, and they have the mini hitters. And perhaps if you two started chatting with each other, there might be an opportunity for them to help get some kids into your program, for you to get some kids into their program. So this is where we're talking about networking here, trying to work each other out. So perhaps you two might want to chat. Yeah, and the key, you know, the key to the program and the program growing is, is getting the kids in and having the kids grow within the program. So, you know, we, we've been light on some of the older swimmers the first year and the second year, but that's going to get better because the kids are aging. So, um, and if once we have the, the mini Mustangs component of it, I think that's going to just add a new, a new uh, area for growth. So. And uh, by the way, uh, Parks Board, uh, I'm pretty excited to announce that this past June, the Mustangs, the Milton Mustangs as a program, they, they won their first tournament, they won their first uh, swim meet uh, this past June. So happy about that. Congratulations. Can I say something quick about what you were just saying? Um, when you were talking about Juan working together with swim, uh, I think Kim could probably say how that has worked out with lacrosse because oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Tim Godby came to Coach Coleman and talked to him about bringing girls into the program. Mm -hmm. And now you went from one girls team playing against boys to 10 teams this season in three yeah. seasons. Yeah. And that's bringing in girls that play lacrosse typically. Coming into the winter to play girls basketball, it's fantastic. And my daughter's playing in She's got a five game. minutes or in about a 30 minutes in her minutes. playoff game. So with Kim's game. program. So. But not before. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, then Kim starts different. asking us which which sport do you like better, basketball or girls? So that's, <laughs> see how that goes. Well, stay out of that. I just, but it is where two <laughs> providers have gotten together and worked out a significant partnership. So. Yes. Well, and Jim said we won our first meet, which is was was great. Where we tend to fall apart in the meets is in those older age groups when you know somebody will bring in a team where they have you know three sets of swimmers swimming in you know under eighteen, and we have one. So you, you're only right there. You, you're limited to the number of points you can win. You're, you know, and you, they have a chance to take, you know, two spots. So, so any of your programs where you have older kids, athletic kids that want to, you know, swim, we'll recruit those guys too. So guys and girls. So, right. It'd be great if we could all help help each other out on in that mm -hmm. aspect. A lot of good. There's a lot of good athletes in Milton. Yeah, there are. All right. Next? Let's do the ladies at the end. So we went all the way down here and the hippy dippy artists. I mean. All right. <laughs> Hi guys. Thank you. Um, Amanda and Star. Star. And we're your new photo programming. So we're bringing photography classes and workshops and summer camps to Milton. So we've kind of noticed through the years that there's been kind of avoid in adult art programming and opportunities for kids um, outside of small independent businesses. So we'd really love to grow. And it's a great supplement to the athletics program that you have. Um, it's some things that the kids can do in off season or to kind of balance the athletics a little bit. So uh, we've been chatting with Jim kind of over the years about really needing it and found the <coughs> opportunity to kind of come up here and grow. So, um, Sorry, you want to say a little background about you? And um, 
we don't have, well, we teach photography, but we don't have long-standing programs. Yep, so, we're brand new. Brand so, new babies yeah, we're, here. We're brand new. Uh, we have not been in any city yet. We've been with the Atlanta School of Photography teaching. We both have backgrounds in um, commercial photography. Photography is our main job, so we've we have photographed pretty much anything you can think of, um, working with kids and adults. And so we want to take that experience and our love for photography and bring it to both adults and um, I think our main goal for kids is more of like a teen tween uh, unit um, because I feel like I myself I have a 14 year old and I'm we've been I live off rocker since I was three so I've, he's been in all sorts of sport programs and different things and it's kind of when they hit that tween age I think a lot of programs fall off um, and in the summertime they don't really have as many options so we want to help them creatively explore. I mean, and it could be cell phone photography too. It doesn't have to be regular, you know, the, the professional cameras. Um, but we really want to just help them play around, be creative, have fun, um, and just explore that, that creative side because I know also having the 14-year-old, this is a very heavy academic area. Um, and I think sometimes the fun can get lost. So we really like to um, teach, but do it in a fun, creative way. And um, I don't know, just no. we're just we just want to try it. We you know we both are moms, and we love what we do. So we thought it would be a great uh, opportunity to offer camps in the summertime for that age group. Um, we are open to expanding potentially, but this we figured we'd just start smaller and then see where it goes. And then as far as the classes, we're thinking quarterly classes for adults and then seeing if uh, the teens and tweens uh, might work as well because I know some schools don't have photo programs because we've seen uh, some actual high school students in our <laughs> photo classes which are more geared towards adults. So that's kind of the areas we're thinking. And with the arts being lost in a lot of schools, I uh, think it's going to fall on some of the community programming. Uh, funding does get cut in schools, but that doesn't mean that it's gone, and it doesn't mean it's out of people's lives. So we just want to kind of get into homes. Um, she and I both, we are currently teaching. We are with the Atlanta School of Photography. Uh, it used to be Showcase, and Showcase Photo and Video was the largest photo store in the Southeast. They closed years ago uh, with the birth of Amazon and BNH, but photography is kind of at an all-time high uh, for the creative arts. So uh, we both teach. I've been teaching seven years. We both have degrees in photo. So uh, we've got a lot of really fun ideas. But like she said, we're starting small. Uh, it'll be three and four week classes, uh, spring, summer, <laughs> fall, winter. Uh, we've got two weeks of summer camps planned, um, one in June and one in July. There'll be five-day programs for five hours. I think we're looking at like nine to one yes. um, and kind of cater into that 11 to 17 range um, and we're just here to make it fun and enjoyable and give somebody you know an opportunity to be artistic and creative so all right yeah. excellent welcome yes. glad to have you on board have you guys gone through a program yet or is it just about to kick off we're just about to... Yep, Tom's helping us kind of go yeah, through the, the council. <laughs> the contract's about to go to council. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. And do you guys need a facility? And if so, which facility? This guy, right here. We right across, right yep. across yep. the way. Perfect. perfect. Yep. Yeah, because we don't... We are not in um, looking for huge um, groups. We like smaller, intimate. We're very hands-on with uh, the students just so that they can grasp, understand, and <laughs> flourish with what they know. Because, you know, I know there are some programs out there that it's just, like, especially summer camps, it's just massive amounts of kids and one counselor. We want to make sure that we have enough, um, we're not too, we're going too big. We want to keep it small so we can help everyone learn. So we saw that facility and we're like, that's perfect starting point. And if we do have a summer camp that has a little bit more, um, we'll be teaching together or some of the just quarterly classes we'll do solo. So we're thinking um, maximum, maybe summer 20 kids. And then our individual classes might be max 12. Gotcha. So they won't be, we're not intending it to be a very large um, Organization. Yeah, it is all about the hands-on. And I think that's yeah. a huge part of our programming is in the world of online learning and YouTube University and all these classes. There's a huge gap in tangible content and people want to know how it's relevant to them and how to operate it on their computer or camera and for their needs. So we're really here to just be interactive and hands-on with people. 
<laughs> and I actually have photographed Juan's kids all that many years ago. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, hope, I did have full baseball on. some of the, the travel teams. And, and you'll be offering classes for the adult children, like this one here. Actually, yeah. that is yeah. a big yeah. part of our program. <laughs> yeah. Really, that's all we see is adult Adults. kids. I mean, you yeah. just want to have them play. So. They call that yeah. photography for dummies. I, I'll lend you the book. Call it Photo 101. <laughs> like kind of, instead of dummies. But yeah, <laughs> that's where you start. Yep. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. welcome. Look forward to hearing Great. how it goes. Thank you. Excellent. We're excited. Very excited. And thanks to Tom and Jim for all their help uh, getting us started. My pleasure. By the way, for all of you, one of the takeaways uh, you'll get next week is we're going to distribute to all of you uh, email program and uh, phone number information for all of our program providers, the purpose of which will be to encourage each of you to reach out on your own. You know, pl please, you know, I'm not saying don't call us, but, you know, if you're trying to get, you know, you know uh, from lacrosse to swimming through me, I'm an impediment, right? Mm -hmm. We want to give you this information so that you can reach out directly. You didn't have to agree that easily. Well, right? well, yeah. Just... Yeah, just <laughs> My gosh, I thought we were friends, Kim. Uh, but uh, you know, what we want you to come away from here with who to reach out to in these other programs to try and partner together. So you'll have that information next week. <coughs> oh, and by the way, this is the first time we've ever had this meeting where we have more than one art program. So please. My name is Carmen Ginto. I'm the owner of Bacht Rock Music School. Um, which is right down the street at Crab Apple Silos Plaza. We have about 240 students learning all sorts of musical instruments and learning how to sing. And we've been trying to partner with the city to provide programs here at that, at that spot right there, most likely. And we're still trying to work out the best type of program. I have curriculum um, from age three up. We have a Rock City program for kids age three to five. We have a keyboard group learning program for kids age five to seven. Above that, we do bands and um, individual lessons. Most of my, well, I wouldn't say most, most of my kids do come from Milton. I think maybe 30% of them attend Crab Apple Crossing. Um, we get a substantial number of them from Birmingham Falls. In fact, my wife's at Birmingham Falls tonight doing their science night. Um, I don't know if any of your kids go to Birmingham Falls, but she's there tonight doing a science program about sound. Um, she's also a piano teacher. I'm more of a businessman. I dabble in it as a bass player, but um, I'm, I'm the guy that does the, the books and stuff <laughs> like that. My background's IT, and I'm a CPA. My background's accounting. But I would love to figure out um, work the best kind of program to offer, we've not quite been able to figure out what program will attract kids. A meeting like this will be great because we can possibly share ideas. Um, I would also be happy to provide free music services to large gatherings that some of the other music or some of the other providers have. If somebody's having a picnic, if somebody's having a, uh, an event, I will provide music. I'll provide DJ service music free of charge or maybe bands. I have a lot of kid bands. I have like 11 kid bands who do rock and roll. They, you've got to see them. They're cute as can be. And they're awesome. Yeah, they are. They, some of them are really, really good, actually. Um, maybe, I don't know. It could be I might have one of your kids. I don't know. I might. Um, but... That's why I'm here, to figure out how to best work with the city. I'm glad I'm here, um, and I'm open to any suggestion. I would love to partner with, with everybody. Summer camp programs, we do them too, but we do them at our school. Um, but I've also done camps at the Jewish Community Center in Dunwoody. I've also supplied segments to other summer camps where we come for a day, do a music segment, um, and... Uh, I'm open to exploration in that, in that area as well. Um, sure, the reason why I might come and do a free DJ event would be to gather names and numbers of kids who might be interested to come to my school and learn how to play a musical instrument. So that's why I do it for free. Um, and would also provide free music to any city event that's happening, and I have. I've, done the, I've provided DJ in 
bands to the Christmas thing that when Santa comes and to the Christmas tree lighting ceremony and to several other events that have happened with the city. And we'll continue to do that for as long as she'll let me. <laughs> so that's what I do. And um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yes. I will tell you the man sitting that you're sitting next to, uh, you know I'm going this one, don't you? I already, I already put on my notes. Uh, he puts on a festival ah, at the like start the uh, in May, at the start of uh, uh, what's called the In Park Tournament. Okay. And they get blow ups and they try to make a really big event out of it. Uh, I think, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, you only got about, what, Ron, about 800 kids in your program? Uh. I don't, yes. know if that, I don't know if that's a big enough crowd for you. But. Well, I'm glad I'm sitting next to Juan. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we would love to do. We, we can provide lots of music, lots of loud music. <laughs> so. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. That's excellent. Juan, we already talked to you tapped, so why don't you go ahead? Sure. Uh, so I'll start with the same old, uh, same old as far as field uh, usage perspective. The, um, we started using field seven this season, which is the turf baseball field, and also uh, continue to use the Birmingham United Methodist Church. We have maxed out both of those facilities from a usage perspective as far as practice goes. The um, growth in the program, I think it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent uh, spring over spring. The uh, mini hitters, five-year-old, six-year-old, so six and under basically, is around 250 uh, participants. So that's pretty good for, for a bunch of little dudes and ladies. So we're doing really good in the younger ages, which obviously is going is to extrapolate out to doing really well uh, in the older ages as these kids grow older. The, um, in the upper ages, uh, we still have a little bit of issue there based on the park being closed and everything else. I would like to see an increase in the 13 to 15 year old. So that's something that I want to talk about going in next year is how can we, we, we still do inter park programming with OC at this age. And uh, it'd be nice to get the numbers high enough next season or in the spring season where we could have our own program for 13 to 15 year olds. So that's something that I want to target with the city as far as how can we market that better and make it known that we really want to have our own program. Because I think it hurts us. A lot of kids that get to high school, they try out for the high school team, they don't make the high school team, they just quit playing. And the, um, the idea for us long term is to, one, provide a place for the 13, 15-year-old kids to play that don't make their high school team. The other one is to have some type of high school programming where we can do some sort of inner park uh, thing at the high school age. So looking out toward the future, we obviously got to keep kids playing longer. Now kids see it, they don't make their can, high school Can you team, speak a little just, more into the microphone, please? Yeah, sure. So now, you know, at this age, in, in, in the day that we're in right now, if kids don't make their high school team, they just quit playing sports. And what we want to see, especially on the baseball side, is the kids continue to play sports even if they don't make their high school team. So what we got to do is have a plan and sort of a vision for how you accomplish that. And I've got a couple things. I've got a couple things that I think we can do for that. But first, we got to get 13, 15 year old kids to keep playing baseball. That would be the number one priority. So I think, you know, looking at five-year-olds and saying, hey, nine years from now, there'll be 13, 14-year-olds. It'll be hard to say how many of these kids are still playing baseball. But right now, what we do know is that we only have 16, 13 to 15-year-olds playing baseball. So that number is obviously too small from a recreation perspective for me. And there's also no high school programming. So once you're 15, for us, there's no well, where do I go next, right? You've got to go to somebody else and play baseball somewhere else or do something. So you can't necessarily stay up Milton with your buddies and play the same guys you played at your whole life and say, I know I don't make my high school team, but I'm going to still keep working and playing. Uh, the other thing is if you don't make a travel, if you're not on a travel team or you don't want to play travel uh, at those ages, then you really just can't play because there's no recreation opportunity uh, within, within our program. So that's something we want to look forward to. Uh, I think, you know, that's the biggest opportunity we have going into next spring. Uh, total participants going to be somewhere in the 850 to 900 range. Uh, like you just mentioned, the uh, I don't have an exact total yet, but I kind of just jotted some numbers, and I think that's going to be about where we end up. The uh, uh, We've expanded the programming in a concept that we call appropriate level play, which I've talked about before, and what we're trying to do is create enough levels where every player and family has a spot where they think that they fit. 
And the um, what's happening in baseball, I don't know if it's happened in other sports, is you kind of either got you're here or you're here. You're the recreation or what we call travel in baseball. And what we're trying to do is create these other uh, you know, niche levels where maybe you don't want to do full travel, but you don't want to do recreation or maybe you don't want to do select. So we have kind of, we broke up our travel program into three different tiers. Uh, we also have a rec select program and a rec program. So we're kind of changing the programming a little bit to think outside the box to keep kids playing baseball longer and to keep them at the right level longer. The reason we went to this appropriate level play concept uh, is because Little League has done a lot of research in this area, and basically kids stop playing when they start playing at the wrong level. It's just that simple. So if a parents push a kid to play a travel, they don't want to play travel, odds are that kid's going to quit playing youth sports, and they're going to find something else to do. Um, so if we can create a level the parents are comfortable with, uh, and they won't push their child to play at a level they're not ready to play at or they don't want to play at, then we'll keep kids playing youth sports longer, which is obviously our goal. Um, the, uh, what, what, uh, as far as improvements go, we, at Birmingham United Methodist, we improved the batting cages. We put netting up there. We worked on the, uh, the benches over at the, uh, at Bell Memorial, we just spent $10,000 on mounds. So we got mounds in all the cages. Uh, we got mats in all the cages. The, uh, I'm saying that cause some of the things we would still like to see improvement on and we're talks of is, uh, can we cover batting cages? Uh, that would be nice. The other uh, big thing that I would like to see looking forward is how can we make Hopewell Middle School more usable? And we've talked about that before, but since this is the forum, I want to bring it up here that if we could have direct parking and direct access to the middle school, uh, we could put netting up on the third base side, whatever it takes, then that field becomes a lot more usable. And just kind of looking forward to continued growth, how can we make the facilities we have more usable uh, than they are today? I think that would also, for the lacrosse guys, can make that field more usable too, potentially, if it was easier to access. Um, the uh, so talking about kind of uh, all-star success for us this year, which is our recreation kids, uh, we had 15 championships, 11 runner-ups, and our all-stars, which is you know definitely a new record for us. And when we when we kind of first started going, the reason I say that is because these are the recreation players. These are the players within the recreation program. These are the kids that come up through Hopewell that are, you know, the Milton uh, residents that are playing baseball. It's not a travel program. It's not anything else. This is the direct result of youth programming for recreation kids to play baseball and then to go out in the community in the southeast. And our players are now the best players in that circle. So within our 7U team won the World Series, uh, which is the Dizzy Dean World Series. And we had several teams win local World Series that are, those are really nationwide tournaments. So the things we've been doing over the last five years are working within the rec program, and we're seeing a lot of success within our advanced rec teams. The, um, another thing I'd like to see, so I kind of made some notes as far as for me, I think it would be cool for all of us to have some component of like volunteerism or where the city could produce something like that where you could say, hey, all the programs we're going to do, three volunteer dates for the youth sports programs and we could forward that to our families and say, Hey, you know, the city of Milton is going to do a volunteer day for X. Uh, we would like to bring out youth to participate in that. Cause I think that's a lot of thing that a lot of things that we are finding difficult, even for advanced teams is finding places for them to volunteer and to give back. So if the city could just create something like that, I think that'd be great. Um, the, the other thing for us is as we sort of we're looking to the future. Sorry, I, well, okay, go so ahead. If there's something I know through Cambridge Youth. We've done a couple things through the city here. Okay. Um, we did mulch over at Bell Memorial a couple of years ago. Uh, we did some stuff at Providence Park. Three Hurricane, years ago. Hurricane Harvey relief. Remember? Yeah. Oh, the Hurricane, Hurricane Harvey. Harvey. But then um, so uh, Cambridge Youth does a volunteer program every year, every spring and every fall of some sort. So certainly, um, you know, even uh, there's the Harvey Relief that we, we partnered with the city and, and took donations. We did, uh, we packed lunches right before spring break for the kids that kind of rely on hot meals from school um, it's through a church here. So, yeah, there's lots of things that we can at least suggest some of the things that you did, we've done in the past. I don't know if they've reached out. Your name came up the other day about an idea for this spring, too. Okay. So if you got things that you want us to do. But they do have some ideas. We painted benches one year somewhere. 
yep. the city. So yeah, you painted benches, you, uh, it, you sealed benches over in Providence Park. Providence Park, Park yeah. yeah. So um, that would be great. One, one, you left out a contribution you made, uh, the Bluetooth interfaces at the four, at the five uh, baseball fields. So we don't have to use the storebook controls anymore? We did. We did the single score at the fields. We also did new L screens that I that I left out, but we put new L screens in all the cages. So <laughs> we're making investments back in the program and making it better for the city and, uh, you know, for the participants. So the L screens are obviously something that every, anybody that uses the park is allowed to use. Um, and, and so are the mounds and the mats. So that's why we, uh, we're looking to make improvements and improve our program, but also make the park more usable. The, um, there's something for the season kicking off. So the volunteers, I think it'd be great, whether that's something the city can, can lead us on or that's something that we have to lead up. I think it'd be better, you know, for us, if I'm being honest, if the city gave us something and said, hey, we'd like you to help us with this, and we could probably take that and run with it. Um, the one, of, So we have Championship Saturday, which is what Jim was just talking about. That event has been great. And that's we do bounces and kind candy. I'd love to have some bands there or anything you guys want to provide and, and you would have access to all the parents and the, and the players there. The um, but our kickoff is not where we want it to be. So, the you know, and thinking about my notes for this, I'd like to we'd like to revisit again kind of having a parade and how can we make the starting event, the opening day event a bigger event and maybe even more of a collaborative event between the programs where lacrosse and baseball, and I know I think lacrosse starts maybe a little earlier than us, but maybe we can do a parade or something around opening day where all the kids at Bell Memorial that are going to play can come and be part of that and, and the city can plan it. it can just be kind of a big event. Uh, the other thing is on our championship Saturday, we, that event's open to anybody. So, and I, I know some of the kids that are there, they come over and hang out, but that's a free event. The bouncies are there. The cotton candy's there. Anybody that comes over, you know, we give them cotton candy. And, you know, it's just a fun event we put on for the park and the kids. So that could definitely be a bigger event that we could share with other program providers. So, you know, basketball could send out to the basketball kids and, hey, there's going to be bouncies and free cotton candy. And, you know, whoever wants to come out can just come out and enjoy that. Sure. What time of year do you do that? <laughs> that's every championship Saturday. So that would be... The, it would be the, la the first week in May, and then it would be the last, uh, like the first or second week in November. So every time that we, <clears throat> excuse me, so every time that we have a championship tournament, the end of the championship, we do that event. So that's two times a year. And uh, you know, just to point out, one of the things that Juan does is on championship, in, in most of the programs, baseball, softball, you know, teams get eliminated, and so championship day is just the last two teams in an age group. What Juan's done that has been very unique is every kid is playing on championship day. It may be the team going for seventh versus eighth place, but they play. So every kid comes out. Our little grandparents come out. And we could take the, uh, the brick area, and the, the entry plaza, and just like we do for uh, Mary Laxmas, we could make a festival out of it and set up booths and, you know, promote your programs and, you know, everyone come out. And maybe it's not the hot time for lacrosse, you know, because you're winding down, but you're going to be recruiting for next fall, you know. It might not be the best time for basketball, but it's a chance to recruit, mm -hmm. you know, so... We, we need to leverage that. We need to leverage that. It's probably around the same time at the end of selections, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, which you'll have the same, you'll have the championship lacrosse teams playing about at the same time. So it is an opportunity for sure. I wonder if we can get them to line up the dates. That would be interesting to see if we could do that. Can parking handle it? I've got 430 parking spaces. <clears throat> After that, we use cranes and hook them up in the sky. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think the other thing there is that's an opportunity to build a sense of community. So one of the things that makes Hopewell a very strong program, and I think the reason for our growth, is that we have a strong sense of community. And anything that we can do within our community, right, to create a better sense of community, whether it's basketball players and baseball players or baseball players and lacrosse, and obviously a lot of baseball players play basketball, a lot of baseball players play lacrosse, but to create more of a community among the players, 
because then if you're just a baseball player or you're just a basketball player or you play the different sports, uh, you may see your buddy there, and it creates kind of that community where you're not just seeing them at school. You know, they come out and they wear their basketball jersey, as an example, uh, and then the baseball guy sees them and says, oh, hey, cool, I didn't know you played basketball, and now you've got that community. And when they're at school, they oh, yeah, you know, I met you over at, at Bell in that program. So anything we can do that helps a sense of community, I think helps all the programs, but it's also important for the kids to kind of understand that youth sports these days has become very transactional uh, in nature. And, you know, to me, kids don't really play sports for that reason. They play sports for the community. So that's just, I wanted to bring that up here because I think it's an opportunity and I'm happy to email anybody. And it's a free, like I said, it's a free event. Anybody can come out. It's way underused because we get more bouncies than we need and we get more cotton candy than we need. So if you go over there and look at the event, you will see, it's not being used as much as it could be if there was more people there. The um, the other thing is we usually do dunk tanks, and you guys would be free to come and use those if lacrosse guys want to get dunked or whatever. Those are you know those are there, and uh, usually those are for the coaches after the game they'll get dunked. But you know any of you guys could use that for whatever purpose you want. We usually have two dunk tanks uh, at the summer event. Can we can we have some parents in our programs that are. Um, can we get them dunked? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we do, I've dunked plenty of them. Able to pay to dunk. I, we, That's a good parents, I would pay good money to Go. have them dunk. The um, Juan, you said you're somewhere around 850 and 900 kids. That's what I have, yeah. That's my estimates between 850 uh, and 900. For those of you not aware, Bell Park itself got closed down in 2014. We reopened uh, in October 2015, uh, limited operation. So spring 2016 was the first season that Juan was uh, in charge. He had between 400 and 450 kids. And now, five years later, he's doubled it. Good for you. Good job. Thank you. That, that's all I had. Thanks, Juan. All righty, so we're back down to lacrosse. Am I correct? I am Brent now. I'm the director of uh, North Georgia Rec and we provide boys lacrosse for the city and then also kind of work with uh, Tim and Dave with Eagle Six for, for girls and, and overall lacrosse in the city. Uh, lacrosse is a, a spring and fall primarily sport. We serve at kids ages first grade to eighth grade. Uh, we're tightly with both the, the high school programs at Cambridge and Milton. Um, I think the best, some of the best, the best lacrosse in the southeast is played here in, in North Fulton and in the city of Milton in particular. Um, from ages from our youth all the way up to to high school um, as you know the Milton's won 13 state championships and they compete on a national level at the high school level but not also our, our youth playing in club teams like Eagle Sticks and, and some of the other ones bring home numerous championships uh, in the summer and the fall so the best lacrosse in the southeast is, is right where we're at um, our season has kicked off last week uh, with our older girls and boys playing uh, our challenge is, like everybody's challenge for outdoor sports, is, is the weather right now. It's terrible. Um, even our, our turf fields are getting rained out just because nobody wants to be outside in 35 degrees and pouring. Uh, the addition of Cox Road is, has been tremendous. It'll be tremendous when we can use it. Um, it'll be able, we'll be able to spread out and not be on top of each other at Bell and opens up uh, field number one or field number seven for baseball. Uh, but right now, I think we're just kind of trying to wait out the weather and, and get things going. That's all I have for, for the cross. I'll be brief. <laughs> if you have no questions, anything, um, let me just jump over to uh, uh, board, your girls lacrosse and just cover across one point. I do want to point out one thing for all of you. Uh, about a year or so ago, this board is the one that recommended that Hopewell Baseball should be allowed to have, well, actually all of our programs should be allowed to have multiple tiers of advanced level teams. You recall that decision. And obviously you now see the benefit of the wisdom of that decision. So Dave, why don't you finish up lacrosse? Uh, David Winsett with Eagle Sticks for the uh, girls lacrosse provider. And I don't know if uh, Brandon knows we're being live streamed when he just said that the Milton teams are the best in the uh, North Fulton. <laughs> He's the girls varsity coach at Alpharetta High School. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully nobody's watching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we started about 10 years ago. 
It was, uh, you know, just a spring sport for a while. Actually, Brandon at Newtown Parks invited us to, you know, he started a fall league, and that's kind of what got the whole fall league kicked off for, for North Fulton and, you know, why it's a year-round sport now. Uh, you know, field space was sparse back then. We played in community areas and neighborhoods. We didn't have any field space. We started working with the city when the city was first formed. And, you know, looking at all of our out-of-city uh, fees that we were paying to Alpharetta to play in their, um, play in their league. Uh, and we realized, you know, if we just invested that in our schools, we'd be much better off. So we worked with the city, invested in uh, uh, Northwestern Middle School, repaired their fields. I think we collectively put in a, over $100,000 into the field. Uh, so it was, you know, good for the school, good for our program. Uh, and we didn't, didn't cost the city taxpayers or or players any more money. Um, you know, now I'm here tonight because the other guys are, uh, I'm, I'm less involved with the program now, Joey and Jason who just left, but the, you know, they're much more active in the youth program. I just kind of helped get it started and I'm here tonight because the others couldn't make it tonight. But um, I'm excited to see how things continue to grow, how the girls are working now with basketball. Uh, like Jim said to another thing we do every Christmas, we have a fun tournament called Merry Laxmas. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and, you know, that might be a good opportunity. You know, Tim D, Tim Godby is the program manager for Eagle Sticks. He does his own DJ while he's trying to coach and everything. I think it'd be fun to have <laughs> kids out there playing or you DJing. And, the, you know, the girls come out to that event. They usually dress up and, you know, like Rudolph or they pick, you know, costumes. They're, you know, they're playing full speed sports, but they're dressed up and having fun. So music is playing. Uh, so that's, you know, another yeah, opportunity. Dressed up. Always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Brandon's been dressed up a few times too. <laughs> and while we're on the record, I think Alfred won the Mary Laxmas High School Varsity uh, tournament this time. So, so yeah, that's a, it's a, about 225 girls every season. Um, and, you know, our field space is much better off. The rain is what hurts us the most. And, you know, I think Cox Road is a fantastic addition. And, you know, the next ask is going to be, you know, when can we turf it? <laughs> so we can, you know, back to back. And that'll be done Monday. <laughs> Pardon me? That'll be done Monday. The discussion or the, the, the turfing? You're going to turf on Monday. Okay. I didn't say which Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Any money. So, so that's a great addition. Uh, that used to be very expensive for the boys lacrosse program. They used to rent that. I think they paid, you know, like $30,000 a season just to rent a few nights a, uh, a week there. So it's fantastic to have that under Milton's ownership now. Uh, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Michael Windler uh, of Milton Boys Lacrosse. Uh, he was aware, one of the things we've identified as an immediate need at Cox Road is we need some screens behind the nets. The nets are meant for soccer. And so when a lacrosse ball goes through a soccer net, it just goes through it. So, uh, you know, Michael kind of helped us with, you know, let's get this. And then he backed up by literally stroking a check for $1,000 to us today. So, you know, we'll be able to match that with the city and get some nets. So, you know, that's the kind of cooperation we're getting. All right. I actually have a question for both of you, so either one, but... How has the weather affected practices and scheduling? Because I know that we've canceled quite a few, and if you have any ideas of what could fix that, and just kind of what you can say about scheduling. I think after we turf it, we need to put a dome over Cox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, 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 been, it's been challenging, um, but it is what it is. We, uh, Tom is probably tired of me texting him every day, asking what baseball is doing, because we're Rearranging practices. We've got teams trying to go out this weekend to, to make up practices. Um, but it's, it's no different than what, what everybody else was having to deal with. So it's, we pushed the season back a week. Um, it was supposed to start next week, and we're going to start on the 7th now just to, to get people a chance to practice before their first game. Uh, you know, just in general, lacrosse is a high-density sport. You put a lot of people in a little space, and the fields really take abuse. Early on, we put the girls on the grass, and the guys got the turf because they're heavier and, you know, tear up grass faster. Now we're sharing a grass field, so that's going to, you know, that we're going to put more wear and tear on Cox. You know, you put adults out there, adult soccer, that's just going to be very hard to manage, I think, maintenance-wise. So, yeah, the next ask, obviously, is turf. You can play, you know, lightning's about the only thing in cold temperatures that stop you. 
uh, from playing lacrosse. Mm -hmm. um, you play, you can play in the rain. You can, you know, just cold temperatures and lightning generally. Well, it's, I know it's something that we're probably going to have to discuss, maybe not here today, but uh, you know, we're just figuring out a way to get everyone to work together. When you've got, I know that you know my daughter plays for Cambridge, and they get access to North Park and sometimes Bell, and I know the boys are at Bell, the boys high school team is at Bell. But we also do have youth girls, and it's something at some point that I think some of them only had one practice in three weeks. So it is something that we might want to work out with teams, to, you know. And I don't know how that can happen. I don't know whether we can work with teams and say, "Hey, listen, I know you've been on the field two weeks. Can we get a couple of the younger girls on here?" Because I, I say this all the time because I used to coach, and, and you guys I know still coach, but at a higher level. But the reality is at these younger levels, the development is for, is with the kids. The game is the treat. We always talk, mm -hmm. the game is the treat, but where they learn the game is actually at practice. And when you don't have practice, I don't even know if it's worth having a game. It'd be better just to take that game time and make it into a practice time, really, because they don't know how to pass and catch. They're still learning all that stuff. And I know Jason might have some things to say. Too. Wait, Jason, Jason's not here. Yeah, mm -hmm. But anyway, um, yeah. but so that's something, that I don't know if that's something we can all work together on figuring out how we can get everyone on the field. I know it's, it's not going to happen this season, but... Uh, future, probably something discussed. Yeah, we're hoping to get our next scheduling meeting. Um, I might have to get my hand in the pot a little bit more and enforce the whole. Every team is going to have one practice per week on turf, and one practice per week on grass. And then if there's some extra space on turf, we can talk about it. Um, but you know, uh, some there's some Eagle Six teams that probably haven't even practiced at all yet. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I know you guys asked for grass, but I still think, you know, if we evened it up and no, put yeah. the boys at Cox for their second practice, you know, right. Northwestern still. Yeah, the girls aren't going to turn down uh, turf. You know, we just did that because, we, you know, we didn't have enough for everybody. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a great problem to have. It's not one we had 10 years ago because 10 years ago we didn't start till March. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a great problem to have. You know, now we're trying to get more play time in February, and it's going to take something like, you know, artificial turf to get there. But, you know, we're making great progress every every year. So, And uh, the pain that lacrosse is feeling this year is something that uh, Hope of Baseball has felt many years. And uh, with the move this year to put baseball on one of the turf fields at Bell Park, that has eased their situation because they had – Many teams last spring, you may recall, was equally wet. They had many teams that the coach met their players for the first time at the first game. Mm -hmm. you know? well, and this, this meeting actually is pretty good. Um, getting people together, baseball, lacrosse, sometimes when it's football season. But, um, you know, sometimes when we go out there, we'll notice the field's not being used. Not that it wasn't scheduled, but it wasn't being used. So it might have been a last-minute cancellation for whoever was out there. But it would be good if we're communicating – because we, I, I, we have seen lacrosse practices change an hour before. Hey, sorry, we can't get there. Can everyone get to this field? And you get as many as you can, but you still get a practice in. So that's something that if we can get everyone working together, we can get something going, too. All right. Yeah, the thing for us is if it starts at home, it's probably not an issue. Yeah. So they're not going to tell me that. But they're practicing. We look at as forecast. Forecast will make a decision. Our policy is 42 degrees in the club and not rain. Um, if it's a light rain, you know, out there. But so if we have forecast of 42 degrees or below an hour ahead of time, we're going to cancel practice. The, uh, if it's above 42 degrees, then we'll go out and play. If it's wet and it's raining that day, and we can get all 10 teams on one turf field, we're going to put all 10 teams on one turf field. And then those 10 teams can get a little square slip. players, they can play caps, they can do something with the ball. Um, so that's the, uh, that's what we've done. I think that's happened more than once before where we, we took the turf and we just put all the teams on the turf field and played a lot of people. Um, so if we, if we say they're going to be there, they're going to be there. I do think that is something that even with Tom, I've asked him before, like, hey, is the turf being used? I'll come back and say, yes, it's being used. I'll take my team out there and then the turf will be used. So, Something I can work right now, and I'm involved in all of our processes. But it 
definitely times when the field is booked. I don't know why, why that is, but right? there's not times where they first week or the first week is the same thing. I tell them go on the schedule, cancel the practice. But you know, that that's as only as good as the coach going and canceling the practice. So if they don't tell you guys, I know you're going to say no, or you don't know that they're actually having a practice. So, um, but that would be the thing for us. I mean, if you see that if it's raining, We had a similar uh, rule with uh, the weather if it was below a certain temperature for Cambridge girls. Is there a city rule? Is there a with a temperature if it's below anything? I'm just curious. There is 32, I believe. So it's 30. 30. Okay. Yeah. Right. It, it's in all your contracts. I think it's 32 degrees. Yeah. Okay. But it also gives the option for each program to have its own weather policy. Yes. Yeah. Because for, for the cross, the, those girls go out there with snow. Yeah. Okay, football will go out in the cold. Right. Baseball doesn't. It's just it's the nature of the sport. It's also by age group too. What you might put a seven year old out there, you know, a fourteen year olds could handle yep. a little bit right. colder. Yep. Yeah, I, I noticed that. I um, something for staff. Is there a way that we can get the calendar more streamlined as far as up to date, quicker? Like if something changes. Because um, I know right now I looked on it before I came here and it said Friday was covered from on field two from uh, five o'clock. I'm sorry, four o'clock to five fifty. But uh, if those things change, um, and I think that's a field rental. I think it said field rental. Yes. So the question is, is I know we talked about this pressure a year ago when we were built, when we were talking about field, that the city was pressuring, or I don't know who it was at the time, but there was a pressure to get the space filled. And I'm curious, can we build in makeup space? Meaning, I mean, is there a way, because quite frankly, if that space wasn't being rented every Friday, and, and maybe it's a change in time, and maybe it's not a big deal, but from, you know, and we can take this time on a Friday to stick teams over there that are missing. We, we've kept Fridays open. Who's been doing that? Okay, because right now I think it's I think it said field rented all the whole month. Well, from, yeah, for, for early, one field, a high school mm-hmm. high school team out there running the fields in, before what five? Yeah. Okay, so Cam- Cambridge five. High School uses the field from four to five fifty. I I try right. to give our programs ten minutes for a turnover. Yeah, but six o'clock on it says it says held for makeups. Oh, so six and on is open for makeups on Friday. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, maybe that's something I need to. I, I need to figure out what that calendar is, but um, okay, okay. I get a little confused. It, it sometimes it doesn't look like there's anything there. I, this time it did, but it was sometimes when I look, you can't. It, I always have to call and make sure is there nothing there. Okay. Okay. Um, I see some folks getting ready to leave. I want to cover one topic, then we're going to go to Kerry. Right. Um, I got trolled recently on. Uh, social media. Uh, you all know about the two walls we have at Bell Memorial Park, the Wall of Champions and the Wall of Fame. The Wall of Fame is intended for permanent enshrinement for any person who has participated uh, in youth sports here at Milton or contributed to the participation. For example, Tim Godby uh, runs uh, Eagle Sticks and he's won 13 state champions. He made it to the Wall of Fame. It's a permanent enshrinement. Um, and so we have nomination on our website, and we encourage you, especially if you've got people you know who have done this, we are very low on nominations. We're taking nominations for the 2020 class through the end of March. So please push it, promote it, you know, okay? But the, uh, the Wall of Champions, okay, that is intended as a temporary honoring of people who, uh, you know, of, of rec programs that have won their championship. And uh, the plaque, you know, each one cost me about 50 bucks, and I have a budget for it for the time being, okay, until one day someone cuts me on it. But uh, 
if a program provider, if you've got a, uh, in fact, we were called out on a uh, middle school girls team that won a, a state championship or something like that. Um, you guys know who wins. We don't. If you don't tell us, you don't get a plaque. But if you tell us, we'll put up a plaque. I mean, I want it full. Uh, now, the person who, you know, called me out on social media, uh, candidly, you know, they don't really understand the whole issue, but there is a point of validity to it. Because right now, almost all those plaques are hope baseball, okay? It would lead you to believe that the only thing we do here in baseball, or in Milton, is baseball. There is one halftime sports plaque. There's like two Eagle Stakes plaques. There's a couple of Milton Sealers, and then everything else is Hope of Baseball. Okay? Um, now, what started happening, for reasons unknown, this past fall, that teams that won their rec league championship in football started getting proclamations at city council meetings. That, you know, I mean, ultimately council does what they choose to do, and I work at the will of the council. But that takes time. It takes, you know... <laughs> it, 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 I don't. I don't want to be disrespecting these kids, but I don't think that honoring a kindergarten, first grade flag football team that went ten and zero is something that we necessarily want to use a proclamation for. A proclamation is meant to be used for something truly momentous and significant. The wall of champions is for that K first grade and another team. I am asking you, help me to help you. These kids win, they want to see their names up there. And I, Kim, I don't care that we don't play basketball at Bell Park. You're a Milton program. This isn't about the wall of champions at Bell Park. This is the wall of champions. If we have a rock band that wins a championship, you know, I'll put them up on the wall. Must yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you got something, you know, we, we're trying to limit it to the names of the participants, the name of the program, the year, and the names of the participants. We're trying to even leave the coaches' names off of it. You know, it should be about the kids. Okay. Um, but the person made a valid point. Why are girls not important on this wall? It's not that girls are not important. I have a daughter. I have a wife. I had a mother, you know. I have sisters. It's that I don't know. If you don't tell me about your achievements, I can't brag about you. So it's all on you. Fair enough? Carrie. Hey, um, I'm another new kid on the block. I'm Carrie Dinelli. I own Challenge Island. I am a hands-on STEAM enrichment program. And just to clarify your educational terms, if you do or don't know, you STEM, I'm sure everyone knows the science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, at some point they realized all the powers that be of education everywhere, realized that all those things are awesome if your kids are great at science and if they can code and they can program. But if they don't have the capabilities to think outside the box, they're not gonna be able to design a building. It's great if they can do the software to design it, but they can't think through the design, they're not gonna be successful. So someone said, let's put arts back into it. And so what I do, it's completely unique. There really isn't anything like it. I would like your baseball players, your I want all of them, send them to me, and I want to make them people that you guys wanna hire when they grow up. And they've done all these studies and said, what's happened to kids that are, are I guess most everybody in here has children at that age, they are digital natives, so they've grown up with, with networks and Instagram and Internet, and they've lost the ability to read body language. They do not know how to communicate and make eye contact. If you make a face at them, they don't always know what you're saying because this is how they communicate, and it's lonely, right? And they don't know how to work with one another. And so what we do is it, it's so basic and fundamental. We literally teach kids how to collaborate and how to fail and how to, when you fail, not hurl yourself on the ground and fall apart, but how to try again. Um, everything we do is all project-based, so the outcome, what they create and what they make is not necessarily 
what's great. It's how they get there. It's how they work with other people. So we work in tribes. It's very whimsical. It's very fun. Um, they, something really simple. This is my favorite story to tell. Five kids in a group, they have two pairs of scissors. And it seems like that wouldn't be a problem, but you would be shocked that that's a problem because they don't know how to ask each other to use the scissors. And so I sat, and I told Tom this story, I sat with a little boy with a group, and they were seven-year-old kids, you know, very capable of talking. And they were, part of what they had to do was to, you know, cut something they were designing. And the little boy was over there, and he was starting to panic. And I said, well, what's wrong? He said, well, I, I, I need some scissors. And the girl next to him is just with her scissors, just to cutting away and kept looking at him. And he literally was having kind of a panic moment because he didn't have scissors, and there wasn't enough for him to have his own. And he kept sitting there, and I said, well, you know, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I need her scissors. And it wasn't that this is a perfectly average seven-year-old. He literally didn't have the communication skills to say, can I have your scissors? And I, so I prompted him and said, well, you need to talk to her. She, and she's just waiting, looking at him, just cutting away. And he finally said, I need your scissors. She looked at him and kept cutting. I said, you've got to ask her. You know, you have to communicate. He said, can I use your scissors? And she went, sure, and hands them right over to him. And he went, <sighs> and I stood there and thought, wow, like we're growing these children that, you know, they can, they can tell you everything about your car, they can find you restaurants, they can look up everything, but they can't ask the guy next to them for a pair of scissors. You guys aren't going to want to hire them when they get older because they're going to sit in a meeting and they're not going to like what he says and they're going to want to leave. And they're going to have a panic attack because they didn't like what he said. And he, what he told them was, your idea isn't the best. They're going to fall apart. So what we do is we work in tribes, and we spend a lot of time on collaboration and just teaching them in a very fun, whimsical way about how to collaborate. So that's kind of what Challenge Island is. I always feel like I have to give this explanation of what it is. Um, I do after-school programs. So I've got after-school running in Cherokee, a couple in East Cobb. Um, I do drop and field trips. I just went and did um, summer, not summer express, the winter break camp over in Cherokee. I live in Cherokee and did um, a camp at the aquatic center. And Tom has been gracious enough to let me throw myself in to do some week long summer camps here in Milton. So I'm super, super excited. I've gone up to Forsyth and done stuff there. I, I run the age, can start with four year olds. I've got amazing, amazing curriculum and programming from four year olds. I've done it with middle schoolers who see me roll in with a colorful cart full of paper cups and things and snub their nose, and 20 minutes later, they're completely in because they spend so much time at school being academic, and, and we're so rigorous with this academic, they don't get that space to explore and to, you know, do something that just may not work the first time and get told it's okay if it fails. I actually tell them when we start, this probably won't work the first time. What you're making is probably going to fall. It's probably going to break, and you're probably going to have to start again. And some of them look at me and go, huh, because that's not what they're accustomed to. So that is, that's kind of what I do in a nutshell. And so I thought, just because this is sort of fun, um, I do simple things with simple materials. So I thought sort of just to give you an idea. So I give them things. We're cup and balloon, right? And so... One of the things they worked on is the design, and one of the things, it's all authentic. So I'm not just adding a craft to the end of something we're doing. I'm actually giving them the opportunity to plan it, and then they create it. They design it themselves. If it doesn't work, they go back. A very engineering process type of thing. So this is kind of cool. This is, they use these, you see a paper cup. I see an antidote shooter that um, shoots antidote at minions, all right? So one of the field trips I did, they're doing this, and they pick these little things up, and they learn, this one didn't work well, hold on, let me try again, because that's what happens to them, and they learn about elasticity, that worked better, and they figure out, this, look, there's science right here, there's art right here, there's design, so I was at a school, and they're making these, and these things are all over the place, and they use marshmallows, and the little boy came up and said, can I have another cup? Said, sure, so he, he took materials, and he ran off, well, so this is what he comes up with, and this is my favorite, so I kept it. Now, what you see is painter's tape and cups, but what he saw was this. He made a double shooter for his antidote, and he got tired of reaching onto the floor to pick up the pieces. So he said, look what I did. He said, I made a holder on my thing for the antidote, right? It's just paper cups, but he thought of an idea outside the box, created it, and was so proud of himself, four other kids started copying what he did. 
So that's what I do. I just teach them to think outside the box, to have a little bit of grit about them and realize that if someone says your idea, this one's better, it's okay. So that's kind of what I did. I've got to have three weeks of camp. I'm, I'm trying to get three weeks of camp going. One is a combination with... Um, yes, so we have... Go ahead, tell. You no, tell. I was going to say, we kind of had a cool idea to do a little bit of a combination camp with Darwin, dance. Darwin. Um, I have some great themes. One is like a steam entrepreneur. It's kind of based on a shark tank type setup. Every day, they're taking on a different area. So one day is um, candy stores. They're trying to create a candy store to get into the uh, Challenge Island Mall to let someone put them in their business in Challenge Island Mall. And so I have a great one with American Girls where they're using the American Girls. They're creating things for their American Girls in stores. Again, not crafts. They're having to design and plan. And so we kind of came up with a neat idea to come in below dance and hopefully cross and get some of the same kids that might want to stay for an all-day camp to do dance in the afternoon and do um, Challenge Island in the morning. So that's kind of my story. <laughs> That's all I got. Cups, balloons, wagon. And, and, and we're exploring bringing um, Challenge Island and her ideas over to Cam Joyful Souls for a couple of kind of pop in hour, hour and a half visits. Yeah. Um, gotcha. And have the Cam Joyful Souls kids uh, attend. Yeah. It's amazing. Class. I could sit here for two hours and keep telling you about it. And the same thing I told Tom, I'm not. By, by nature, I'm not a salesperson, so me going to principals and teachers and doing this always is overwhelming to me. I'm a teacher by trade, so I can tell you the teacher end of this and the everything about this that is awesome. So, you know, I'm not good at selling it, but I always hope that I can passion right past the, like, sales skills part of it and the talking over myself, but it's amazing. And I, you just should send all of your children to me. I would like your whole baseball children. I would like to show up at your championship day and put a table out. I will draw a crowd. I will bring them. What you said about not being afraid to fail. I, I, how many times have you said that to a kid in sports? They don't want to do something different, and they won't do it. They won't go and do what you're telling them to do because they're afraid to fail. And you're going, I want, I want you to fail. Today's the day. This is practice. Fail. This I tell them that straight yeah. up. I looked at a group the other day, and they, I was at the aquatic center over in Cherokee, and the little girl looked at me. She said, what do you mean? I said, this is probably not going to work the first time. And she said, well, that may not be fun. I said, oh, but it will be fun. It'll be fun when it works the second or third time. And sure enough, like clockwork, the first time, they were making penguin slides. And so they were having to design. They were trying to use um, to get rid of friction and use momentum to make some penguin slides. And the first time, it went sideways. And she looked at me. She said, it failed. I said, I told you it was going to fail. So what are you going to do? And I'm dramatic, so I throw myself on the ground to show them the non-behavior. <laughs> and they think that's really funny because that's just what I do. And she goes, I guess I'm going to go try again. Well, what, and it eventually worked. And so, oh, look, it worked. So they just need that because we're not, they're getting instant gratification and they're getting everything right here, right in front of them. And it's a downside of technology, I guess, for them because the te technology is a way to solve a problem. Like the real defini definition of technology doesn't involve electronics. It's just a way to solve a problem. And so that's it. We're unplugged. I don't, there's no plugs. It's all theme-based. It's fun. They don't know that they're, they don't even realize they're developing skills. Pretty cool. You know what? Hour, hour and a half. I've got a catalog of challenges. You give me a topic. I've got, we've got a sports camp. I have a baseball player too. He's my biggest fan. He gets mad. He's already said, can I come to all the camps? He eats this up with every fiber of his little being. And he's also an athlete, basketball, baseball, loves it. So yes, I, an hour and a half. We've got one with Roberto Clemente Field. They design a baseball field. I mean, I have a whole after-school program that is all sports-based. So it's just completely all the topics that they're into. There's a Minecraft one that involves no computers, no boring Minecraft, but all the fun elements of Minecraft that they love. It is fantastic. So you can come and do like a baseball field version of this, essentially? For Absolutely. Should be. <laughs> and I can do it for lots of kids. They work in tribes. So... I do it as a facilitator, so I could do it for you guys and put you in groups of five, and we've done it for adults, which is even funnier watching adults have to let their guard down and act a little childish for some of these. It is very, very fun. It's a great team-building activity to put a bunch of grown adults and kind of make them take their edge off and problem-solve, because adults sometimes need these skills, too. I mean, I won't, wouldn't call anybody out, but I've sat in some meetings and seen some adults that maybe could use some good collaboration communication skills, so yes.
big groups, small groups, super much, anything. There you go. Thank you. That's all I got. Thank you, Karen. Sure. And uh, uh, our last, we've got a couple of program uh, uh, reports that are going to be given because a couple of our program partners couldn't be here. Are you, uh, are you, are you letting Kim off the hook? <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot Kim, didn't I? Oh my gosh, I'm like the stepchild. Kim, Kim and I go back, I'm sorry, you deserve that, man. Uh, Kim Coleman uh, runs the second largest uh, recreational sports program we have in the city now. Uh, Kim, go ahead. <laughs> We're trying to get like Juan. Um, Let's see, Kim Coleman, Halftime Sports. Uh, we are a proud provider of the uh, youth basketball programs for the uh, city of Milton. Um, we also uh, we provide year-round basketball for all the kids in the city of Milton. Uh, spring development programs, summer basketball camps, uh, fall Sunday programs, and our winter rec league. Our winter rec league has eclipsed uh, 500 kids. Where uh, When Jim first um, hired us, we were... <laughs> We were, yeah, it was, it, was, it was rough. I didn't like Jim Craig very much. Um, you know, and also one of our, and I've taken some notes, one of our biggest accomplishments is not just growing the program, but we've uh, developed some real strong relationships with the custodians. I know that may sound kind of crazy, Brandon, you could probably attest to this, but um, we don't have to worry about the gyms being set up on Saturday morning or practices the doors being open and goals being up because uh, the relationship we have with the custodians now is, is a fantastic relationship and they have everything set up for us. Um, where a couple of years ago, we were a nervous wreck on Saturday morning, driving from gym to gym, making sure that the doors were run locked. Um, so now we don't have to worry about that now. Um, our custodians are fantastic. Even if there's a, a last minute, uh, play or debate program going on at one of the schools. They'll text us to let us know, hey, coach, you know, Jim's not available tonight. Uh, so, get, and they give us plenty of time so we can notify our coaches and parents to let them know. Um, we cater to boys and girls, 5 to 15. Um, we're now starting, because of the growth of, uh, and the networking, but like Joey said, with uh, Tim Godby, the girls program is blowing up at a tremendous rate. It's, it's really moving fast. Uh, and these young girls, um, their basketball skills are okay, but boy, they get after it. Their, their defense is nasty. I mean, they just go and go, and we absolutely love it. And it continues to grow. Um, in fact, Dwyer's team won tonight, 30 to 18. I just got a score update. Yeah. <laughs> um, we we are we're a small company, you know, but we we partner with some some big companies. We're we're partners with the NBA, the Junior NBA, uh, the WNBA, USA Basketball. Um, in fact, what we're doing, I was telling Phil uh, and Joy, what we're doing is uh, the NCAA is going to be here for the Final Four, um, April fourth through the sixth. Uh, April 2nd, that Thursday, we're going to invite um, some of our kids and parents down to uh, the actual slam dunk and three-point competition where they can be on the court. Um, they'll have their own private session, uh, autograph session with the, with the participants. Um, they'll be able to throw uh, T-shirts into the stands, maybe get a little TV time. Um, there will be national anthem buddies, so when the, they're doing a national anthem, our kids will be standing by the actual three-point contestants and the slam dunk competitors. Uh, it's just something different that we've always tried to do for our families here at the city of Milton. Uh, we're blessed to be able to have great partnerships with the NCAA and NBA and, and, and those folks. And whenever opportunities like that come about, we like to pass them on to our families. Um, that's going to be coming up uh, April 2nd, so if you guys get a chance to watch the event, be sure to see a bunch of kids wearing City of Milton halftime sports shirts uh, on the court. Um, everything is going fairly smooth, and I hate to say that out loud because uh, it is. it um, is. Although I did walk into the Crab Apple First Baptist Church tonight, and there was like a big pond of water on the court. Side. Yeah, it's starting to expand onto the actual court. So we, we used a bunch of halftime sports towels and stuff to, 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 to get the water up. 
Um, that kind of leads me into one of our, our biggest challenges. We're, we're, we're growing, which is great, but we're, we're kind of busting in the seams in regards to gym space. Um, we just need a gym. I'm going to just throw it out there. <laughs> we just need a gym. Um, I say our, huh? Monday? <laughs> no, no, I don't want to hear Tuesday. Um, I want a date behind that, Jim Craig. Um, you know, because then we can kind of control our own destiny. Right now, we're, we're nervous to grow because we're, we're almost maxed out at gym, gym space and courts. Um, but I guess that's a, that's a good problem to have right now. Um, but if we can, whatever you need from us to help try to, you know, get that on the docket. I know Phil is a, a big supporter of ours and, and uh, it's kind of helping us with that, that. Through one of our most recent things that we did a month ago, maybe a little, two months, two months ago, ago yeah. where we talked about getting, working on the facility was top priority, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah multi-purpose facility was mentioned. That'd be fantastic because yeah. we could fill it up with basketball stuff every night mm -hmm. um, and, and even in the off season with basketball tournaments, um, which generate some, some nice revenue um, for those uh, facilities. So um, that's kind of where we're at. I think like most providers, a couple of our challenges are parents. I'm not going to say any names, but, um, you know, we've, we've had a couple of, and Jim is, he put this in perspective for me because I was going crazy over the weekend. We had a coach send an email to city manager and send to Jim Craig. And, you know, I was the worst person to ever walked the face of the earth. Our program was horrible. And it all stems from they didn't get what they wanted, you know. Um, one, <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, one, one coach wanted us to change his game time. We didn't, so he forfeited the game. And he doesn't understand, but that disrupts not just his families, but the opponents and, you know, their families. Um, so, but Jim said that's one person out of 500. So he kind of talked me off the ledge. And I will say that for down. the girls' program, I don't know much about the boys' program, but um, – Jason's a coach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously coaches. We've got mm -hmm. Lewis Thurman, who's um, yeah. one of the coaches, and he's also with lacrosse. And because everyone knows each other, we've worked out where we pull – someone's – too many kids, we're going to miss a practice. Don't yeah. worry about it. We'll practice together. Yeah. And we, we do this all the time. And yeah. that's because there's a community. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I think that's a big deal for everyone to work mm -hmm. together. Just, yeah. Otherwise, you got kids who didn't get to practice. And, and by the way, the one team we practice with all the time – we compete with them all the time. We're, we're one point away. Like every week, it's like they beat us in practice, but we beat them in a game. So, but it's fun. And uh, but you need that that um, those coaches working together. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're very fortunate. You know, we've got the two knucklehead coaches that you know, that's just who they are. Yeah. But everybody else is fantastic. Yeah. Just fantastic. You know. So, I'm here to answer any questions, any suggestions, any ideas. Love to work in Woodstock, too. <laughs> Just saying. The, we, uh, handle, we handle Cartersville, thanks to the gym and the uh, city of Tucker. As well. Yeah, turn them on to Rip Rock. I don't know who Tucker. gets credit, who? but the uniforms are fantastic this year. Okay, because mm, I was so nervous about that. <laughs> T-shirt, the uniform, I mean, they look good. Well, thank you, Joe. I was yeah. extremely nervous <laughs> about that. Um, Made them colorful and oh, yeah. pretty cool, but I'm not a kid, so I don't, I can't, I'm not, I think like, yeah. yeah, I can kind of tell, but I, you know, you try to think like, what would a kid like? Oh, yeah. And it, it worked out pretty well, so we're going to do it, but thank you. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Um, we have a couple programs that have uh, proxies here to speak on them. Uh, Sean Michael? Uh, okay, yeah, I'll talk for football, the NFL. Um, Nitcha Lewis sends her regrets. She's not able to make it to the meeting tonight. So they're they're getting ready to begin their registration period. Uh, this year's a little earlier um, than at least the prior two years. So they're opening up next Sunday, March first. Um, they are planning to do some additional marketing. 
uh, and stuff this year. Um, you know, as a whole, I think a lot of people are aware uh, the overall um, participation rate in football in general has sort of declined, uh, especially in tackle. The flag is, uh, you know, obviously still very, very popular. So I think they're they're trying to come up with some uh, more creative ways to. Um, build some of those uh, tackle programs because I think over the last two years there's really only been one one team per age group for the most part um, uh, except the fifth graders so the younger groups have been all at one uh, fourth and fifth grade have, have been a little bit higher um, let's see uh, they are I guess still working also Jim with the uh, where is that part um, the city of Alpharetta too as well so I think it sounds like it's going to be something similar to what last year's was. I don't know what problems that may or may not present. We're going to need to know uh, probably by around March or April where they're going to be at because if uh, Alfred is going to hold a hard line about uh, uh, who's playing where, we need time for field planning. Okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get with her and, and, and say, because she said, you know, they utilize both North and uh, North Park and Bell last season. Um, they're anticipating having increased registration this year. Um, so, you know, obviously more space would be ideal because um, I think they only used one field at Bell last fall. Well, last fall they only had flag football. They, they, they can get one field. Right. Okay. Uh, because yeah. we still have to have lacrosse. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we also have practice space which can be used at the uh, schools, the, the elementary mm -hmm. and middle schools. Uh, we have, you know, we may have some space over at Cox Road. Yep. So, you know, it's, the getting the games is, is one thing, is getting the practices in is another. Obviously, football is a more practice-intensive uh, type sport than baseball, which gets one practice a week, and lacrosse, it gets two. Uh, but uh, we need this very clear direction of the requests okay. by like April. Okay. Um, and you know, and then they, they invited uh, myself or any uh, other representative from the, the, the board here uh, to go to any of their board meetings if we want, so. Yes, yeah. So, um, but that's basically it really for, for right now, but I will I will get with her and talk to her about the, the plan for, for field space and what the goal is. Thank you, Sean Michael. Yep. Tom, rhythm and shoes. Yeah, I got a, uh, a, a written report from um, Ms. Perry Sanders, who runs the Rhythm and Dance, or uh, Rhythm and Shoes Dance Program. Uh, she is a new provider. Um, she was brought on late last year. Uh, we just were almost done with our first winter session. Uh, she had three classes make. Um, they're great, my daughter's in one of them. Um, she does a great job. She uh, previously was, um, or still is uh, doing dance in Alpharetta uh, for the Alpharetta program. And uh, with the MOU uh, kind of going away, um, she lost a lot of Milton residents. Uh, so she came to us and we're doing a program here. So she's running both programs. Um, she's gonna start, she's gonna do uh, some spring programming and summer camps. Um, as Carrie said, they're gonna do kind of a a combo camp where it'll give parents an opportunity to do a full day kind of option without doing the typical day camp. Um, I thought it was a really good idea. It wasn't mine, um, but I started running when it, the minute someone brought it up. Um, some challenges that she's having uh, are very apparent. She's using the Bethwell Community Center as her dance studio and uh, Bethwell Community Center is not a dance studio. It's, you know, she, she's got young children with, uh, you know, and the parents aren't in the room. So when a kid needs to go to the restroom, you got to go outside, get the parent, walk through the class to take the kid to the bathroom. Um, very inconvenient for her. And then uh, there's also a kitchen in there. The, apparently the younger kids are going and opening, closing the cabinets and kind of just all over the place. Uh, she's making it work and she's doing a great job. But um, not having a, a real room that really is suited more for dance um, is a challenge for her. Um, let's see. 
She's happy with having a playground out there. Uh, it's good for the siblings. And uh, that's about it. That's what she had written here. But uh, she's doing a great job. And um, I'm happy that she's here. <laughs> it's a good program for girls that to do. All right. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe we've covered all of the programs we have now. Obviously, you can see things have grown from a couple years ago. There's one issue I would like to address to all of our program providers. It came out of a very unfortunate event this past November. Um, <clears throat> but a, uh, a involved our football program. Uh, there was a situation in which an individual in Forsyth County, whose team played against one of the NAFL teams, uh, he, he believed that there was an illegal player on the team, and uh, he, there's the suggestion that uh, this man's son got hurt, and he wanted uh, information because he wanted to pursue litigation, and so he filed an open records request now, let's explain something. In the state of Georgia, the open records request laws are meant to be interpreted very liberally because of the desire for transparency in government. Every one of our program, provider, program partners, you are providing a service to the city. It actually says that in your contract. And the law specifically indicates that when you're providing a service to the city, whether it be providing a basketball program, or uh, doing HVAC work. If your records are requested in an open records request, then you have to comply. Now, in the case with this particular program, it was the first time they'd ever experienced it, and there was quite a bit of pushback. Uh, I will tell you, <laughs> there is also very specific language about one, what can and cannot be provided. For example, any information on someone who's 12 or, un or younger gets redacted. Uh, cell phone information gets redacted, okay? Uh, it's, it's quite a bit. But in the end, what happened here is the uh, football program provider did, in fact, provide all, everything that we needed. And that data, we took it to the city attorney, and they redacted it. And he literally, he, he, one of the pages he got was a chart that said the name of the team, it, do, it does allow to show what school the person went to, but everything else was redacted. Okay, so you got 20 lines of redacted information. But it's the law says we have to provide that. Okay, so the one lesson we kind of learned there is that having never gone through that before, the program partner felt that they were kind of doing me a favor uh, by providing the information. You're not doing me a favor. You are complying with the law. Okay? We've never had this experience before. I've been here seven and a half years. It's the first time I've ever had to deal with an open records request on a recreation program. But there was quite a bit of learning. And that's why uh, all of you have contracts. Uh, you, we have additional open records language. Uh, I wasn't aware of it, but we are. So as we go and we get smarter, these things we have to know. Okay? Uh, anything that involves children, I will completely and totally work with our lawyers to make sure we are not disclosing a single piece of information beyond what the law requires us to provide. This man got 67 pages of virtually nothing. <laughs> wow. But got we got <laughs> him what we legally are required to provide. I don't want to give out your private information, okay, but... This is the law, okay? With that, Mr. Chairman, I believe we have cut the, reached the end of the agenda. Mr. Hofstetler, is there anything you would like to share with the group? No, but it was, this was a good meeting. It's, uh, we had advisory board meetings too, so I'm learning a lot as we try to build the, you know, the rec department in Woodstock as well. Great. So, Who knows? Thank maybe, you for everything. Maybe some of your programs are baseball would want to come over and play some of ours. Yeah, yeah very well could. Yeah, it's not that far. <laughs> All right. All right. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. There we go. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's a fun one.